Okay. So the story uh, in the knowledge argument is that Mary knows everything physical there is to know about what it's like to see the color red. Um, but having spent her entire life in a black and white room, she's never seen red herself. Uh, but then one day Mary's released from her room and sees red for the first time. And Jackson says, uh, when Mary sees red for the first time, she would learn something new. She would learn what it's like to see red. So because she'd never seen red before, she didn't know what it was like to see it. So then the knowledge argument goes, premise one, before her release, Mary knew all the physical facts about the phenomenal character of red experiences. Premise two, after her release, Mary learns a new fact about the phenomenal character of red experiences. Therefore, not all facts about the phenomenal character of red experiences are physical facts, and therefore physicalism is false. So notice that the second premise of the knowledge argument, so that goes after her release, Mary learns a new fact about the phenomenal character of red experiences. That premise is the conjunction of two claims. So first of all, propositional knowledge. So upon seeing red for the first time, Mary acquires propositional knowledge about the phenomenal character of red experiences. And second of all, new proposition. So the object of Mary's acquired propositional knowledge is a new proposition that she did not already know. So the second premise of the argument is the conjunction of propositional knowledge and new proposition. So with that in mind, some philosophers have objected to the second premise of the knowledge argument by accepting propositional knowledge, but rejecting new proposition. So these philosophers say that uh, Mary acquires propositional knowledge about the phenomenal character of red experiences when she first sees red, but the object of that knowledge is not a new proposition. Rather, it's an old proposition that Mary already knew under another mode of presentation. So these philosophers say that Mary acquires propositional knowledge only in the sense that she comes to know this old proposition under this new phenomenal mode of presentation. But I'm not going to discuss that kind of reply today. I want to discuss the other kind of reply that philosophers have offered to the knowledge argument. Um, these replies I've called non-propositionalist. So these philosophers object to premise two by rejecting propositional knowledge. So they say that Mary does acquire knowledge when she sees red for the first time but not propositional knowledge about the phenomenal character of red experiences. So Mary learns something, but not a fact about what it's like to see red. So here's one kind of um, variant of this, this reply, um, which has been offered by David Lewis and by Lawrence Nemero. So this is what's known as the ability hypothesis. So according to the ability hypothesis, rather than learning a fact about the phenomenal character of red experiences, Mary merely acquires a set of abilities relating to such experiences. So for example, the ability to remember, imagine, and recognize experiences of the color red. So Lewis says, the ability hypothesis says that knowing what an experience is like just is the possession of these abilities to remember, imagine, and recognize. It isn't knowing that, it's knowing how. So Lewis says, when Mary um, sees red for the first time, she gains these new abilities. She doesn't gain any factual knowledge, any propositional knowledge. Another kind of non-propositionalist reply that's been offered is the acquaintance hypothesis. So the acquaintance hypothesis says that rather than learning a fact about the phenomenal character of red experiences, Mary merely acquires knowledge by acquaintance of such experiences. So Earl Connie says knowledge by acquaintance requires the person to be familiar with the known entity in the most direct way that it is possible for a person to be aware of that thing. So you might think of knowledge by acquaintance as knowledge of, knowledge of something, knowledge of experiences of the color red. So it's not knowledge that, it's not knowledge how, it's knowledge of something. Uh, Mary becomes acquainted in this really direct way with experiences of the color red. Uh, 
That's the acquaintance hypothesis. So the ability in acquaintance hypotheses agree that when Mary sees red for the first time, she does not acquire phenomenal propositional knowledge. That's the key claim. So they disagree about exactly what she does gain, but they agree about what she doesn't gain. She, they agree that she doesn't gain the propositional knowledge about what it's like to see red. She doesn't acquire phenomenal propositional knowledge when she sees red for the first time. So I'm going to call philosophers who endorse that claim phenomenal non-propositionalists. So phenomenal non-propositionalists say that when Mary sees red for the first time, she doesn't acquire phenomenal propositional knowledge. And that's the kind of reply, these non-propositionalist replies, that I want to argue against today. Okay, so that's the knowledge argument and non-propositionalist replies. So let's put that to the side for one moment. Um, and now let's go through a, a entirely different problem in metaethics. So this is the wishful thinking problem for non-cognitivism about moral judgments. So just a little bit of background about this to this problem. Um, big debate in metaethics between cognitivists and non-cognitivists. Cognitivists are people who say that the acceptance of a moral judgment is a cognitive belief-like mental state. Um, so for example, to the acceptance of the judgment that lying is wrong, most plausibly, that's the belief that lying is wrong. Non-cognitivists, on the other hand, say that the acceptance of a moral judgment is a non-cognitive desire-like mental state. So the acceptance of the judgment that lying is wrong is not the belief that lying is wrong, but some kind of non-cognitive attitude, such as disapproval of lying, or perhaps the desire that lies not be told. It's this non-cognitive desire-like mental state. So here's a problem for non-cognitivism. Consider a subject, Edgar, who justifiably accepts the following claim. If lying is wrong, then the souls of liars will be punished in the afterlife. So suppose that Edgar's got really good evidence for that conditional claim. And now suppose that Edgar considers the morality of lying carefully, carefully and subsequently makes this moral judgment. Lying is wrong. So from premise one and premise two, and in the absence of any counter evidence, let's suppose, Edgar now infers the souls of liars will be punished in the afterlife. Okay. So the problem is this. It's intuitively obvious that it's rational for Edgar to make this inference, to, hit, to infer his conclusion from premise one and premise two. After all, this reasoning just seems to be a straightforward application of modus ponens, right? If lying is wrong, then the souls of liars will be punished in the afterlife. Lying is wrong, therefore the souls of liars will be punished in the afterlife. That reasoning looks completely rational, completely unproblematic. However, non-cognitivism seems to imply that it's irrational for Edgar to make this inference. Notice that Edgar's acceptance of his conclusion is a belief about the fate of liars in the afterlife, right? The souls of liars will be punished in the afterlife. That's a belief. Even non-cognitivists are going to accept that that's a belief. On the other hand, Edgar's acceptance of his second premise is not a belief according to the non-cognitivists. Lying is wrong. The non-cognitivist says that Edgar's acceptance of that premise, that judgment, is some kind of non-cognitive desire-like attitude. So Edgar's conclusion was a, was a belief, but one of the premises that he's used to establish that conclusion was this desire-like attitude. So this means that for the non-cognitivist, Edgar has reasoned from a desire-like mental state to a belief state. He's reasoned from this desire-like attitude towards lying to this belief about the fate of liars in the afterlife. And this kind of desire to belief reasoning is analogous to wishful thinking and is irrational. So just as it's irrational to reason from your desire to win the lottery to the belief that you're going to win the lottery, 
it's irrational um, for Edgar to reason from this desire-like attitude towards lying to a belief about the fate of liars in the afterlife. But this implication of non-cognitivism, that Edgar's inference of his conclusion from premise one and premise two is irrational, is irrational, is implausible. That implication is implausible because as we've seen, it's intuitively obvious that Edgar's inference is rational, right? So consider what the non-cognitivist seems to be saying here. Uh, they say that Edgar can accept if lying is wrong, then the souls of lies would be punished in the afterlife and accept that lying is wrong and yet not be rationally entitled to conclude that the souls of lies will be punished in the afterlife. Uh, that implication looks implausible. And that's the wishful thinking problem for non cognitivism uh, In essence, the problem is how can they explain how this, this inference is rational? This is how Dorr, um, the philosophy who draws, draws attention to this problem, puts it. According to the non-cognitivist, all that happened when Edgar came to accept premise two was a change in his non-cognitive attitudes. He acquired no new evidence or other beliefs relevant to the question of the fate of lies in the afterlife nor did he intuit the truth of his conclusion a priori or take himself to have done so. So if believing his conclusion would have been irrational for Edgar before coming to accept premise two, it was irrational for him afterward as well. Okay, so that's the wishful thinking problem for non-cognitivists about moral judgments. So now I want to return to the non-propositionalist replies to the knowledge argument that I discussed in, that I outlined in section one, and argue that those replies are undermined by a problem analogous to the wishful thinking problem. So let's turn to that problem now. Okay. So here's um, something important to reflect on about phenomenal non-propositionalism. So remember, this is the view that when Mary sees red for the first time, she doesn't acquire phenomenal propositional knowledge. When Mary sees red for the first time, we can imagine her making this phenomenal judgment. That is what it's like to see red, right? So she sees red and she thinks that's what it's like to see red. Uh, that judgment I've called, that's what it's like. So remember, according to phenomenal non-propositionalists, Mary does not acquire propositional knowledge about the phenomenal character of red experiences upon making this judgment. So when Mary comes to accept this judgment, she doesn't gain any propositional knowledge about what seeing red is like. This means that non-propositionalists, it seems, should say that this judgment lacks propositional content. Okay, so the judgment, that's what it's like to see red, it seems like non-propositionalists should say that judgment lacks propositional content. Because if this judgment did have propositional content, then presumably Mary would acquire phenomenal propositional knowledge upon coming to accept, coming to accept this judgment according. And that of course is precisely the, um, the claim that non-propositionalists want to deny. So if this judgment, that's what it's like to see read had propositional content, then presumably when Mary comes to accept that judgment and come to accept the proposition lurking behind that judgment, she would thereby gain some propositional knowledge about what seeing red is like. Non-propositionalists want to deny that Mary gains propositional knowledge. So it seems like they need to say that that judgment lacks propositional content. Okay, but that claim that the ju that judgment lacks propositional content, I think gets non-propositionalists into trouble. So imagine a slightly different case now, let's suppose that as before, Mary knows everything physical there is to know about what it's like to see red, but has never seen red herself. Um, but then one day, suppose that Mary is shown a rose. Now, let's say that Mary doesn't know that the rose is red, right? She doesn't know that the rose is the color that she's been learning about. Okay. But she sees the color of the rose and thinks, if that's what it's like to see red, then I have seen a red rose. Seems like a reasonable thing for Mary to think. Now suppose that at some later time, Mary is shown a strawberry and she knows that strawberries are the color that she's been learning about. She knows that strawberries are red and she recognizes the phenomenal similarity between her visual experiences of the, the rose and strawberry. She can see that they're the same color. So she thinks, so she thinks back to the rose 
and she thinks, ah, so that is what it's like to see red. So where that refers to the phenomenal character of her rose red experience, so she's thinking back to the rose now, Mary's phenomenal judgment here, here is this, that is what it's like to see red. So Mary so far has reasons like this, premise one, if that's what it's like to see red, then I've seen a red rose, premise two, that's what it's like to see red. I suppose that from premise one and premise two, and in the absence of any counter evidence, Mary now infers her conclusion, I have seen a red rose. So here's the problem. It's intuitively obvious that Mary's inference here is rational. It's rational for her to conclude, make her infer her conclusion from premise one and premise two. Um, again, this just seems to be a straightforward application of modus ponens. If that's what it's like to see red, then I have seen a red rose. That's what it's like to see red. Therefore, I have seen a red rose. That seems completely rational, completely unproblematic reasoning. But for phenomenal non-propositionalists, it seems like this inference is irrational. It seems like it's irrational for Mary to infer her conclusion from premise one and premise two. Um, Notice that Mary's second premise, that's what it's like to see red, that judgment, um, we've said they seem committed to saying that that judgment lacks propositional content. Okay. But if that premise, if that judgment lacks propositional content, then it doesn't provide Mary any propositional evidence for her conclusion. So that means that Mary has no more propositional evidence for her conclusion in virtue of her acceptance of premise two than she had before coming to accept premise two. And so if Mary cannot rationally infer her conclusion from premise one alone, then she cannot rationally infer, at least not rationally propositionally infer, her conclusion from premise one and premise two. We might get onto that, um, uh, that qualification about propositional inference later. But at least here it seems like uh, if premise two doesn't have any propositional content, then Mary can't use it as part of this modus ponens reasoning um, to reach her conclusion. But this implication of non-propositionalism that Mary's inference of her conclusion from premise one and premise two is irrational is implausible because it's intuitively obvious that Mary's inference was rational, right? She reasons, if that's what it's like to see red, then I've seen a red rose. That is what it's like to see red. And yet the non-propositionalist has to say, it seems like she, she isn't rationally entitled to conclude, I have seen a red rose. And that implication looks implausible. So just as non-cognitivists about moral judgment seem unable to explain how it can be rational to make inferences from moral judgments, phenomenal non-propositionalists seem unable to explain how it can be rational to make inferences from phenomenal judgments, because on their view, it seems like these phenomenal judgments lack propositional content and so don't provide any propositional evidence. Okay, so that's the analogous problem that I think is faced by non-propositionalist replies to the knowledge argument. So now I want to turn to a particular kind of reply that I think non-propositionalists might offer. And I'm going to argue that this reply is unsuccessful. So this is what I've called the background belief reply. So this is the way in which non-cognitivists have most commonly replied to the wishful thinking problem. In cases where it's intuitively rational to infer a new belief from a moral judgment, this new belief is justified not by the moral judgment itself, but by background beliefs that the subject acquires upon making that moral judgment. So here's an example of how this would go. So consider again the case of Edgar. So Edgar reasons, if lying is wrong, then the souls of liars will be punished in the afterlife. Lying is wrong, therefore the souls of liars will be punished in the afterlife. It might be that uh, Edgar 
bases his acceptance of premise one, if lying is wrong, then the souls of liars will be punished in the afterlife, on a belief like this, what I've called premise one star. The appropriate norms for forming moral judgments are enforced through punishment in the afterlife. So let's suppose that Edgar has really good evidence for that claim, premise one star, and uh, base his acceptance of premise one on premise one star. So because Edgar thinks that the appropriate norms of forming moral judgments are enforced through punishment in the afterlife, he thinks, well, in that case, if lying is wrong, then the souls of liars will be punished in the afterlife. Um, and then it might be that upon coming to accept premise two, so that was lying is wrong, It might be that as Edgar makes that judgment, he justifiably forms this belief, premise two star. The appropriate norms for forming moral judgments supports the attitude of disapproval of lying. Okay. So Edgar, let's suppose, accepts premise two star at the same time that he accepts premise two. So just as he comes to think lying is wrong, he, uh, as a result of that, or at the same time as that, thinks the appropriate norms of forming moral judgments support the attitude of disapproval of lying. Okay, from premise one star and premise two star, Edgar can now rationally infer the souls of liars will be punished in the afterlife. Okay. So that, that inference does look rational, okay? even for the non-cognitivist, because premise one star and premise two star are both beliefs. Um, and the, the inference of the, that con the conclusion seems to follow from premise one star and premise two star. So this inference does look rational. So the background belief reply says, look, it, it is rational for Edgar to accept his conclusion, um, but it's not on the basis of premise one and premise two. So we don't get into this trouble with, well, Edgar's moral judgment, premise two is not a belief, so how can it license the conclusion? Because actually it turns out Edgar's, uh, Edgar's conclusion is justified by these background beliefs. And even the non-cognitivist accepts that these are beliefs, and so they can provide propositional evidence. Um, they, they, they're belief states, so they can license uh, Edgar's conclusion. So I think non-propositionalists might want to offer an analogous reply. So they might offer this kind of background belief reply, according to which having accepted premise one and premise two, it is rational for Mary to accept her conclusion, right? So once Mary has accepted, if that's what it's like to see red, then I've seen a red rose and that's what it's like to see red. They say, yes, it is rational for Mary to conclude I have seen a red rose. But according to this reply, Mary's acceptance of her conclusion is justified not by premise one and premise two themselves, but by background beliefs that Mary acquires upon coming to accept premise one and premise two. So what might these background beliefs be? Well, let's suppose that upon coming to accept, uh, if that's what it's like to see red, then I've seen a red rose, premise one. Uh, it might be that Mary forms this justified belief, premise one star. If roses are red, then I have seen a red rose. That would also seem like a reasonable thing for Mary to think as she's looking at a rose. Upon accepting premise two, so that's, that's what it's like to see red, upon making that judgment, Mary may form this justified belief, roses are red, right? So when she sees the strawberry and she sees, she knows that strawberries are red, and she sees that the strawberry is the same color as the rose, she thinks, oh, okay, so roses are red. Seems reasonable. So now from premise one star and premise two star, Mary can rationally make this inference, I have seen a red rose. So that reasoning does seem rational. If roses are red, then I've seen a red rose. Roses are red, therefore I have seen a red rose. And that's fine according to the non-propositionalist because um, there are no phenomenal judgments in that reasoning, so they can say that both premise one star and premise two star are both beliefs um, and both have propositional content. Um, in which case, we can see how they would provide propositional evidence for Mary's conclusion and we can see how Mary's inference would be rational. So according to the background belief reply, it is rational for Mary to accept her conclusion after accepting premise one and premise two, but not on the basis of premise one and premise two. 
Rather, Mary can accept her conclusion rationally on the basis of these background beliefs, premise one star and premise two star, which Mary comes to accept as she comes to accept premise one and premise two. It's those background beliefs that do the justificatory work, not premise one and premise two themselves. So I think that this reply is unsatisfactory. Because I think it's intuitively obvious, not merely that it's rational for Mary to accept her conclusion after coming to accept premise one and premise two. I think it's also intuitively obvious that it's rational for Mary to accept her conclusion on the basis of premise one and premise two. Um, let's look at that argument again. If that's what it's like to see red, then I've seen a red rose. That is what it's like to see red. Therefore, I have seen a red rose. I think it's, it's intuitive to say that it's not just that Mary's conclusion is licensed somehow, it's that it's licensed, licensed precisely on the basis of premise one and premise two. It seems like premise one and premise two themselves do the justificatory work. And it's this second intuition that it's rational for Mary to accept her conclusion on the basis of premise one and premise two that non-propositionalists seem unable to vindicate. So sure, they can accept that it's ultimately rational for Mary to accept her conclusion, um, but they don't seem unable, at least as we've seen so far, to vindicate the intuition that she can rationally accept her conclusion on the basis of premise one and premise two. That's the, that's the target intuition, that's the intuition we wanna vindicate, and non-propositionalists seem unable to vindicate that intuition. So I think this background belief reply is intuitively unsatisfactory. And it's worth noting that that reply that I've just made, that same kind of reply has been made against the background belief reply in the context of the wishful thinking problem against non-cognitivism. So when non-cognitivists have offered this kind of background belief reply, um, they've met the same kind of challenge. So David Enoch, for example, says, so he's, he's just outlines this um, background argument that the non-cognitivist might say, uh, licenses Edgar's conclusion about the souls of lies in, um, in the afterlife. Uh, and Enoch says, look, the background argument that the non-cognitivist has outlined is clearly unproblematic, but this alone will not do because the background argument is very different from the foreground one. Even with the background argument up her sleeve, rejecting the foreground argument as irrational is for the non-cognitivist too much a departure from our pre-theoretical judgments. I think Enoch's right about that, and I think the same thing can be said against the non-propositionalists um, in, in our context. So I think, sure, the, the non-propositionalists can say that this background argument is rational, um, but rejecting the foreground argument as irrational, again, seems too much a departure from our pre-theoretical judgments. Okay, so that's the background belief reply, um, and that's why I think it's not satisfactory. Here's another possible reply that I think non-propositionalists might offer. I don't have much to say about this reply. I include it just to see what people think of it. So if you have any thoughts about it, please do let me know. So this is what I've called the non-phenomenal proposition reply. So remember that the problem for the non-propositionalist arises from the claim to which we said they were seemingly committed that phenomenal judgments lack propositional content. That's, that's the claim that gets them into trouble because once you've said that phenomenal judgments lack propositional content, then they can't provide any propositional evidence. And it does seem like non-propositionalists are committed to that claim because if phenomenal judgments do have propositional content, then it seems that when a subject comes to accept a phenomenal judgment, then they would acquire phenomenal propositional knowledge. The non-propositionalist wants to say that when you make a phenomenal judgment, like that's what it's like to see red, you don't gain any propositional knowledge about what seeing red is like. Um, in which case, it seems like that judgment, that's what it's like to see red, must not have any propositional content. If it did have propositional content, then when you make that judgment, you presumably would gain this phenomenal propositional knowledge. Um, but there is a way for the non-propositionalist to block that implication. So they might say this. 
phenomenal judgments, like that's what it's like to see red, do have propositional content, but the relevant propositions are not phenomenal. Um, so here's an example of this kind of strategy being employed. So Michael Tai says, uh, the content of the judgment, this is what it's like to feel pain, is not a proposition about the phenomenal character of pain, but is instead a non-phenomenal proposition, such as, this is pain, or I am in pain right now. Right? That's, more like an, that's more a proposition about me than a proposition about the phenomenal character of pain. So on Tai's view, um, this judgment, this phenomenal judgment, that's what it's like to feel pain, does have propositional content. It's just not a proposition about the phenomenal character of pain. And if a view like that is correct, then we can explain both why subjects do not acquire phenomenal propositional knowledge upon making phenomenal judgments. The explanation for that is that these judgments lack phenomenal propositional content, right? So you don't gain any phenomenal propositional content when you come to accept that's what it's like to see red because the proposition behind that judgment isn't a proposition about what it's like to see red. And how you can also explain how subjects can rationally make inferences from phenomenal judgments. So the explanation for that is that these judgments do have some propositional content. So if they have some propositional content, then they can provide propositional evidence for new beliefs. And so it might well be rational to make inferences from those judgments. Okay, so I think that that strategy, the, the non-phenomenal proposition reply, um, could, could help us explain both of these things, uh, both of these points. But I suppose my question is, look, is this, at least the most obvious question to me is, is this a plausible analysis of the propositional content of phenomenal judgments? So at least at first, it seems to me like, look, if the judgment, that's what it's like to see red, if that judgment has any propositional content at all, it's going to be a proposition about what it's like to see red. Um, it seems kind of odd to me to say, sure, it has some propositional content, but the proposition is something else um, that's not about what it's like to see red. Um, so at least at first glance, that doesn't seem to me like an attractive analysis of their propositional content. Um, but as I say, I'd be interested to see what you think about that. So please let me know. Okay, so that's the non-phenomenal proposition reply um, and just my first, first thought on it. Okay, so just to conclude then, non-cognitivists about moral judgments seem unable to explain how it can be rational to make inferences from moral judgments. And it's, this is a problem because it's intuitively obvious that such inferences can be rational. And similarly, phenomenal non-propositionalists, so these are people who deny that subjects acquire phenomenal propositional knowledge upon making phenomenal judgments, seem unable to explain how it can be rational to make inferences from phenomenal judgments. And this too is a problem because it's intuitively obvious that such inferences can be rational. And if that's right, then that would undermine non-propositionalist replies to the knowledge argument. So replies that say that Mary doesn't gain propositional knowledge when she sees red for the first time. So it seems like if what I've argued here is correct, that when Mary sees red for the first time, she does acquire propositional knowledge about what seeing red is like. So what Mary gains is not merely knowledge how or knowledge of, but knowledge that. Thank you very much.